Hi, welcome to the Engineering Q Vectors introduction. Uh, I'm calling them Q vectors. I was going to call, just call them engineering vectors, but you'll uh, they're calling them Q vectors for reason. I'll show you why in the in the, in the presentation. And I've changed the nomenclature of the course. I'm calling this is because it's my university course. This is Q vector course one, and this is presentation zero, which is the introduction. Um, and this engineering Q vectors was formerly known as the new math construct. Uh, this course is for uh, basically anyone who has high school algebra, geometry, and trig. It's also for engineers, uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, because we're going to, uh, Q vectors are an expansion of classical vectors. The main contribution is a more complete vector multiplication which retains sufficient information to allow for the reciprocal function of vector division. Other interesting outcomes is we end up with a proper unification of vectors and matrices and this is different than the unification you might be thinking of. This is for the engineers and physicists and mathematicians. In classical mathematics, a vector is considered a matrix of one row or one column in that sort. And I'm going to show you when we get into the course that that is ridiculous and it leads to all kinds of problems. And I'm going to show you there's a different way to unify vectors and matrices that makes sense from a dimensional standpoint. And by unifying that that way, I believe I didn't get a chance to go through all this because I needed to get this stuff out for ethereal mechanics, so I cut back on how far I was going with it. But I, right now, I presently believe, and this work is not done yet, that this same technique unifies quaternions, complex numbers, phasors, and Clifford algebra, etc. Again, this is ongoing work. And there's also in this the revelation of a Q continuum which is really a quasi-scalar dimension that's needed for three space and above. You won't see it in the two space derivations. The Q continuum is, is a fourth dimension which allows three space vectors to work properly. It has both dimensional and scalar properties. And that's why I'm calling it scalar, quasi-scalar. And I named it, because it starts with a Q, I kind of named it after the Star Trek character Q, played by John Delancey. And the most logical place for Q, and we'll go through the derivation at that point, and we'll see this when we get to multiplication, is the most logical place for Q is the zero dimension, the very first dimension. Okay. Uh, and again, the Q product results directly from the arithmetic multiplication of three space. This is not something I made up. This is not inferred. This is if you when we go through the multiplication, we're going to find we have extra stuff that does not fit into what classical theory in vectors tells us it should be there and we'll go through the logic to explain where it, what it is and where it should go. And present vector theory is a dimensional train wreck. It's very sloppy, it's erroneous, and has ambiguous handling of dimensions. We'll cover all that when we get to the derivations of multiplication. And by strict adherence to the rational dimension rules along with conservation, it was realized that these extra products are a fourth dimension which I called the Q continuum. And this is why professionals need to restart from the beginning. So don't skip class, all you physicists, engineers, and mathematicians. Okay, but we'll not be getting to the Q continuum again until the section on vector multiplication. Okay, uh, also the other byproduct of all this work is enhanced vector algebra. In other words, I believe handling vectors, which uses extra brackets to keep track of the order of operation, because now the order of operation of multiply and divide is now important. Okay, vector A multiplied by B multiplied by vector C is not the same as B times C and then multiply by A. And also vector multiply and divide are now right and left specific. You can have a right divide and that's not the same as a left divide. Okay, as of this moment, the vector multiplication division paper is under review by a math journal. I have selected a, a journal which allows the author to retain the copyright. Uh, if the paper is actually accepted for publication, these videos may be suspended in order to support the review process. Also, uh, I, if it is accepted, there may be a limitation on what I can publish. I have to find out what that is. I don't think it's in this case because I retain the copyright, but we'll see. 
So who are the audiences for this video? Well, professional engineers, physicists, mathematicians, and others, we have to go back and re-examine the basics. So don't skip. The basics will be more rigorously defined, slightly augmented, and there will be myths that are busted and new definitions. For beginners, you're in luck. You don't have to unlearn anything. Okay, if you are an undergraduate and you're learning vectors for the first time, if you uh, go through this with me, you're going to learn things about vectors and matrices that they are not going to tell you in class. And it's consistent with what you have to do in those courses. The only thing that's really going to be new is the multiplication and division stuff. So everything before that, addition, subtraction, and matrix operations I'm going to sh are the same as they were before, but I explain it a slightly different way. Uh, that might make a lot more sense to you. And also, if you're just uh, somebody that's part of the math, math hungry masses out there, as long as you have a good foundation of algebra, drama, geometry, and trigonometry, you should have no problem following along. Okay, this is a general course outline. I'm not going to read it to you. This is this video here, and, and these may change depending on how the production works out, but I'm guessing it's about going to be about 20 videos. Uh, in this video, we, we just went through the introduction, and now we're going to just do a quick introduction of the origin of vectors, where vectors came from. A vector is essentially a magnitude and direction. A magnitude and direction. And we'll explain what that means in a moment. In this course, when we go on, I'm going to be expanding the definition of vectors a little bit. Okay, so magnitude and direction is how a vector started, but as this course goes on, we're going to expand that definition to include other things like apples and oranges of all things. Okay, and vectors evolved from early graphical techniques such as dead reckoning, which is actually the term given used in early ship navigation. And this is a, a blurry map that I got from clip art, sorry. Uh, I put a little wind rose on it. That's called a wind rose. Most people think these are decoration. I'm going to show you that uh, these actually have a critical part. This is, makes the map actually useful. And so what would happen? Let's assume you're a ship at sea and you know your position is here and there's a storm coming and you need to get into port over here in this blurry part of the map which you can't see because this is clip art. Um, so how do you get there? Well, what you need is you need what's called a parallel ruler. Now this is not quite the right one. I couldn't find an image of the right one. This has angular measurements on the outside. We need one that's got linear distance gradients on the outside. And they do make those. Okay. And what you do is you take your parallel ruler and you put it where your ship's location is and you put the other edge where the port is that you want to sail into and then you slide out the other part until it goes over the center of the wind rows. From the wind rows then you can read the direction that you need to travel and then from the gradients on the edge of the ruler you can figure out the distance you need to travel to get to port. Okay now what you would then do is call it up to the captain you'd say captain uh, we need to take a heading of so many degrees and a distance of so many nautical miles. And the captain says, fine. We see, well, how does the captain do that? Well, for direction, the captain has a compass. This isn't one that a ship would have back then, but it's, it's what I had in clip art. And the other thing he would do, so that would give him his direction. So he would just steer the ship until the ship is heading in the right direction. Now, there may be a north to magnetic north conversion in there. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, bother you with that right now. And then what he would do for figuring out distance is he would use a chip log which would give him his ship's speed. What's a chip log? Well, it's basically a spool of fine rope, or of narrow gauge rope, with a special flotation device that is designed to drag in the water. And what they would do is one sailor would throw this off the back of the ship and at the same time another sailor would flip over this minute glass while the first sailor is going to basically let the rope slip through his fingers while it's being pulled out. And every time he feels a knot go between his fingers, he's going to count each knot. And then when the timer runs out, the number of knots that he counted in that time is his speed. And he's going to go to the captain, 15 knots, sir. And that's where the, that's where the term, the speed knots comes from. You know, when you hear sailors say we're traveling at 15 knots, that's actually what it is. It's, it's derived in how quickly this rope plays out behind the ship. I always thought that it was based on nautical mile. I thought it was like a contraction of naught. It turns out that nautical mile is a derivation of this method of measuring speed. So that's where the term knots come from. It's really knots. <laughs> and prior to the GPS, the military spent considerable time training personnel in land navigation. I know I went through the courses. Uh, it's also called orienteering. 
It's now done by fund for civilians, and you can go to Wiki Orienteering. Uh, by the way, I don't know why they need a flag, but that's the interna international flag for orienteering. I don't know when you'd ever use that. Air traffic controllers, I'm sure you've heard the, tune, the, term, the term that we need to vector that aircraft in. Well, that's what they do. They, they, on their radar, they call the airplane over the radio and say, you know, um, American flight such and such, uh, please take a heading of so many degrees uh, and speed of 200 knots or whatever. Uh, so they basically uh, give vectors to uh, vector in an aircraft for landing or to put an aircraft into a holding pattern. Okay. And now vectors got evolved from all that. Now they're a little bit more complicated. In engineering and science and mathematics, we have mathematical models for vectors that allow us to do some very interesting things. Um, like, for example, this is a civil engineering beam on a structure that's going to hold it firm and another structure that's going to allow it to roll. And what they show here is force on the beam every so many distances. That's the way you would model a beam with a load on it. And this curve shows you how the beam is going to de 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 depress with the load on it. And that's what the new vector analysis techniques allow us to do that kind of math to understand how a beam will deflect. And likewise, for aeronautical engineering, now this is kind of a misnomer, the flow is actually going to go around the wing like this, and vectors show the flow. Um, but, I mean, I mean, we engineers know the air flow is going around the wing, but if you were new, you would think the flow is going through the wing. And this vector here shows the lift force developed from the Bernoulli principle of the air going around the airfoil. And because there's friction on the airfoil, there's going to be a certain amount of drag pulling the aircraft back. And so this com uh, composite vector here would be the total aerodynamic force. And this is how we add vectors to find those things out. Vectors can represent flow, force, speed, pressure, friction, inertia, drag. All of these items are a magnitude and a direction. Flow is a magnitude and direction. Speed, force, pressure is a magnitude and direction. Friction is a magnitude and direction. Now, inertia is interesting. This is key here because there are certain things vectors can't represent. These things are what they call scalar fields. Energy is a scalar field. It can't be defined in terms of a vector. Time can't be determined. There's no direction in time. It just flows the same way. Charge can't be defined in terms of a vector field. But recently, in ethereal mechanics, we redefined mass. Mass couldn't be defined in terms of a vector, but now it can't, because now mass is being replaced by inertia in ethereal mechanics. So this leads to a revi revision of rule of acquisition number 18, which used to read, use the force loop. And it's, I've reworded it now, it's use the vector loop. Because remember we said before, on an inertialist body, force as a vector may, not ha it may be meaningless. Okay, so if we have models of nature that follow vectors, those are very deterministic models. And so if there are no vector models to describe the behavior system, then something is wrong. And again, basically on the last couple of slides, we showed that we can reinterpret mass as inertia. We've changed it from a non-vector uh, phenomenon to a vector phenomenon. Okay, and I'll let you read the rest of this slide. I put that in there for fun. All right, so Q vectors. In time, as the ethereal mechanics progresses, all measurable quantities will be represented with Q vectors. And the time will be the very last to fall. Okay, recap. I gave a general overview of vectors prior to Q vectors, gave you some teaser information about Q vectors, and I discussed the course outline and the student prerequisites. Thank you. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, if you want to pay tuition for this course, go to my website and, and donate. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just go to my website, push the button. My website's woefully out of date, and the first page on my website has a donate button for uh, PayPal, I think it is. Thank you very much. Oh, where's my...